Hey, everyone. Welcome to Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer, food maker, or artisan selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. I'm Cat Fields-White. And I'm Bridget Myers. We're longtime farmer's market managers, educators, and consultants. Today, we're going to chat about how managers and vendors can work together to make moving a market temporarily less stressful. Whew. And you're in the midst of that, aren't you? <laughs> oh, wee, this is relevant. <laughs> Very. Today's episode of Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast, is supported by Square, helping small farmers, food makers, crafters, and market managers increase their incomes by making it easy to process credit and debit card sales on the street and in the tents. We use Square ourselves for selling shopping bags and t-shirts at our market info booths and for invoicing farmers and vendors online for space fees. The income you generate appears promptly in your bank account without spending time or money on end-of-day closeouts. Square's user-friendly system makes it easy for our farmers and vendors to track inventory and payroll and generate clear reports. For more information on reducing stress and increasing your income with Square, click their logo on the resource page at FarmersMarketPros.com. Well, welcome back to Tent Talk, everybody. So today we're discussing moving a whole market and how it's not as simple as scooting a couple tents down the street. Not that scooting tents down the street is without trauma. <laughs> I feel like any vendor that's asked to move 10 feet, much less 20 or 30, is just pretty excited about it sometimes. Scooting one tent two feet could cause... My sharpers will never find me. They're not going to see me over here. I'm usually over there three feet that way. Uh, <laughs> you know it. it's true. We're creatures of habit. That's right. And we try to make sure that everyone is in their spot on regular market days over and over and over every week. But then once in a while, we have to pick up and move the whole market. That's true. Things happen. Yep. I mean, sometimes you're just adjusting because you lose, say, you're a, a market with multiple blocks, mm -hmm. as are we. Sometimes you lose one of those blocks because of construction. And so you have to shuffle the whole market and figure out where to put those folks. And sometimes an event happens and you have to move the entire market. Where do you find a site that can accommodate that whole market. Yeah. So finding a space to move your market that will fit everybody and also be within proximity of the place that you're in now. I mean, these are all just, it's quite a Tetris type puzzle to figure that all out. And we have done it on multiple occasions. And we do hear from folks in our Farmers Market Pros community on Facebook and at our conference and just speaking to other market managers, even in town, that this is just such a pain point for market managers to have to try to figure this out. And the vendors definitely feel that pain as well. So we want to talk about how to try to make it as smooth as possible. Of course, these things are not smooth, but uh, making them as smooth as possible so that we can uh, make it, you know, a happy day instead of <laughs> frustrating, of a frustrating day. day. It's going to be a long day no matter what. I think the first part is negotiating the move. So a lot of times a special event will come in. So we we have... Art Walk, which is a major artist event, fine artist that has come into our neighborhood once a year. I feel like one year we had twice a year, maybe because they'd rescheduled one and then they added another. Yeah. And oftentimes, not every year, but every couple of years, there's an event that our local historic church puts on or that some other organization puts on. And even though we have a really long-term relationship with our nonprofit partner, the business district that we produce these markets for, somehow they don't seem to realize, even after all these years and us whining and carrying on and rending our garments, they don't <laughs> seem to realize that it's a big deal to close the market for a day or to move the market for a day. So we, our starting point is always that, no, we can't close the market for the day. Mm -hmm. And then, then the whole thing embarks on how much do we have to move it? Where do we have to move it? Sometimes an event that's coming in will say, well, this will be easy. Just put two blocks of it here and then put two blocks of it down the street there and then put the other couple of blocks like down at, down at Elm. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> nope, that won't work. That's not going to happen. So let's find a spot where the whole thing can go. So, you know, starting that negotiation you have to make your partners or whoever's asking you to move realize that closing or moving a market for a day pushes customers to other markets or worse to big box grocery stores where parking is easy and you only have to go to one register. And, you know, so will they come back? I mean, you're just creating that possibility that they might not. 
And, you know, for some vendors, if you let vendors opt out of a move day, which we often do, especially farmers, we encourage people to be there. And, you know, we have a pretty strong attendance policy. But on a day when we move, sometimes we know conditions aren't going to be optimal for certain farmers. And so some of those farmers opt out for the day. Well, do they go to another market? And then will they come back? It's, you know, it's our, we have an urban market that's big and crowded and you do a ton of business, but it's also logistically it's a lift. Will they decide, hey, you know what, maybe I don't need to make that much money. I can go to this little market where it's just calm and quiet. <laughs> yeah. It's, well, are the grasses going to be greener when these folks, either shoppers or vendors, go somewhere else for the day? So it's all those things that are kind of clicking around in our brain when we talk about a move. I'd like to take it as a compliment that our business partner and our district group thinks that we can just scoot the market over, no big deal, because we make it look so easy. We do. <laughs> you've become a master at this. I feel like you've managed the last few moves, and you are really on top of it. But even though you make it look easy, I know you're tearing your hair out and doing hours and hours and hours of work behind the scenes to make this work. I mean, so for one thing, you have to look at whether the site somebody's suggesting you move to is appropriate in many ways. Do you have to get a new permit? Exactly. Yeah. Do we have to um, close a driveway? Do we have to loop a driveway? There's different residences. There's different businesses on this street. Is there, I mean, in our particular case, we're, you know, we're in a very dense urban area. When we move our market over, there are certain trees that are on that street whose branches hang too low and you can't pop a tent underneath them. So it looks like you can just take all the tents on this street and pop it over to this street. It's the same linear footage on that street. But this new street has six or seven trees that are low and and kind of point out into the street. And so you can't pop a 10 by 10 under there. You'd have to scoot it out, but then you're cutting the fire lane. So it's all of those things. And so I'm trying to say, OK, I have to shuffle these tents over here. I have to loop this driveway here. So is it appropriate for your whole market to move there? Does it fit? It just takes a lot of extra measuring. Yeah. I'm out there a lot of days measuring and remeasuring and second guessing my measurements and going one day and it looks clear and going the next day and realizing that a business rolls their big uh, dumpster out into the street. And which days is the dumpster on the street? And is that going to be there on Saturday? So is there a residence in a different spot where a vendor with a generator usually goes? So you can't necessarily just make a direct parallel move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. I, in fact, and then the other thing is proximity. Yep. So you want it pretty close to where your market usually is. So even though there's a street that is six blocks long, not the same exact six blocks, but you pick up one at the top, you drop one at the bottom. Even though that street might be better or easier to move on to, it's farther from the market's weekly position. So will your customers find you as easily? You know, yep. I think you can move 10 feet and your customers will still find <laughs> you. But when you're moving a block or two or three blocks, some of them will find you and yeah. some new people will find you. But, you know, it's an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So I always try to opt for the street that's just one street south of our typical market. But again, it's all of these things. And then especially during COVID, we had a lot of restaurants that popped up outdoor dining parklets into the street. So that's what happened this past August when we moved the market. I We had already used the street many times. I had measurements. So I just went out to double check everything and realized there were two restaurant parklets that were in this street. And so I couldn't put a tent in front of them because it would cut the fire lane. And so I had to rework the entire map to try to fit all those people because it was right in the middle of the farm section in California. Mm -hmm. I have to have all the farms together. And so anyways, it's just those little things that kind of pop up, even if you move regularly for an annual event, there are still things that come up, you know. Yeah, changes happen that you're you're not aware of year to year. So it's mm -hmm. tricky. I've seen that happen, say, at the Ballard Market. So many parklets. Uh -huh. And then at one point, because the restaurants were all still closed, they were using the parklets as booths. It was very, very clever. Oh. But now all the restaurants are back and mm -hmm. the market's really busy and the restaurants want to be open and, you know, take advantage of that crowd, do brunch. And so they want their parklets back. Yeah. And so they've had to really do some Rubik's Cube kind of moves up there to make sure that everything works for everybody, the local businesses, the residents, and, of course, our farmers and vendors in the market. For sure. And I love a restaurant parklet, so I'm a big advocate for making that work. <laughs> so we did piece around those parklets, and we will again in April when we have to move the market again to that street. I think there's still one left that we have to move around. But, yeah, it's just kind of moving around things that are on that street in your new location. Um, I mean, we do try, I think, as much as possible to make – the market for that day mirror the market that is typical so mm -hmm. that farmers and vendors don't feel disoriented and customers don't feel disoriented. And oftentimes you can't mirror it exactly for all the reasons you've just explained, mm -hmm. um, but you can try to keep it 
mostly the same as what your market looks like on that other street. So if you've always run a market that's in a long aisle with two booths on the other side, which is really typical, it's kind of a grocery shopping kind of mindset. If they move you from your city street into a park, don't suddenly turn into a circle of booths, you know, <laughs> or or don't turn into little pods of booths. Those can be really effective arrangements for a farmer's market. But if your market and your farmers and vendors and your shoppers aren't used to that, switching up their whole mode of travel through the market is going to just kind of freak everybody out. <laughs> Try to keep some things as consistent as you can. And also keeping like vendors together. Uh, just usually I, I'll ask vendors, I'll say, hey, this other spot opened up like it's a corner spot or it's in the middle of the market. Like, do you want to switch? Do you want to move into this new location? And I swear these vendors are like, no, I just want to stay right here because like my buddy's next to me. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's true. Which I get. But, but when you think about it as a vendor, it's like, OK, if you have so a trusted person next to you, like you can run to the bathroom real quick and they watch your booth like that kind of stuff is happening. And if you're next to a vendor where maybe the personalities don't jive as much, that can be a hindrance for a vendor. So I do understand that. But I'm like, buddy, I'm trying to move you to a corner. Are you joking? (laughs) I know. I've seen it so many times. Mm -hmm. So that can be helpful when you move a market to week try to kind of keep in mind, keep those neighbor pods together. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're working with a market for a long time, you know that so-and-so gets along really well and that these two would probably clash. And so you don't want to switch them into a, even a temporary spot. They're already going to be under stress from moving. Don't switch them to a spot where all of their neighbors are unfamiliar. Exactly. So, it feels like a kind of wedding seating arrangement situation. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Or like this farmer is like the mother-in-law that no one wants to be next to. Oh, no, I have to put her next to this other buddy that just is gets along great with her. So, yeah, it is kind of a, uh, and it's you know, and and obviously we are always thinking about that weekly at our markets. But once we find a pattern that works, so I'm not changing, I'm not changing and rearranging folks often week to week. So I'm that's not top of mind. But then when I go to move the whole market, I suddenly have to think about everyone's personality. Real in depth. <laughs> that big wedding seating chart. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect comparison. Yeah. So then the day of the move, to, to get ready for that, you want to um, be sure you do a lot of written advisories. So you're emailing out to vendors, letting them know that it's going to move on that day. Um, you want to clipboard it, what we call clipboarding it. So you're walking through the market with a clipboard. you got your whole roster. You've got some little columns to check off. And you're asking people, did you read that email? Um, Whether or not you read that email. And I love the ones that go, oh, I got that email. I didn't read it. It's like, dude. (laughs) You're going to be setting up on the wrong street all by yourself next week. So, (laughs) And that almost always happens. Yes, there's always somebody that winds up on the old street fully set up before anyone realizes it. I'm, (laughs) I'm not. I've had a couple of those where I'm just not sure. Hun, did you look around at all and notice nobody else is here? They're just in the zone. Yeah. (laughs) It's early. It is. It's hard. So, yeah, make sure that you let them know. Get the word out. We'll talk in a minute about timing on getting the word out. Make sure you have plenty of help. Yep. We usually bring in, you know, extra folks to help us that day, if at all possible. Um, And then maps and alpha lists that cross-reference, I think, is just invaluable. Mm -hmm. So whatever you usually do for a map that shows where each vendor is, you want to make sure you have an alpha list of vendors so that everybody that's helping you, and especially the folks that are helping you that maybe are not on the market team every week, it's easy for them to say, oh, wait, you know, let me look under your business name and then um, and then we'll point you in the right direction. I do always love being out on the street with a clipboard that has that alpha list and having a vendor pull up who I don't recognize. Maybe they sent a new employee that day. And I say, what's your name? And they say, Karen. I'm like, OK. And who are you working for? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the dip guy. <laughs> OK, that <laughs> narrows it down to 15. <laughs> you don't know which business you're working for? Let me help you through this. Let me see one of those tubs in the back so I can read the label and I'll tell you. <laughs> Exactly. Tell you where you're going. Yeah, we always bring in extra help. <laughs> Last summer when, when we moved to the market for the big church event, my husband and my daughter came out at 3.15 in the morning with me and helped mark the street and they helped direct all the vendors to their locations. And It's the, a family affair. <laughs> I felt like my mom did when I it's was a, a child. <laughs> yep, see, following in my footsteps. That's Just right. dragging the family into any business or project you have come up. Just getting everyone involved. And if your family doesn't usually work with you, you can bring them in for a special event and then they'll appreciate you that much more and say, oh, this is why you're so tired when you get home. 
I understand a little bit more. Excellent point. <laughs> yeah. So Remind you... us to do a, a family working with you episode and, and cling to that as an advantage. <laughs> For sure. And the other thing about clipboarding, too, is um, because we do this with a lot of our vendor advisories. We'll send an email advisory out and it goes to the owners of the business, which may or may not be the person that's in the booth that's coming to the market and setting up every market day that you have. So making sure that you go around, this happens every time I say, hey, did your boss tell you that next week we're going to be on a different street? And that boss had maybe replied back to my email and said, okay, got it. But they never told the employee. It and so maybe they're going to tell them on Friday night for Saturday market. But you know what? Or maybe they're going to forget to tell them. <laughs> or maybe they're going to forget. So do yourself and that staff a favor and just give everyone under the sun a heads up. Yeah, I like that that day of or um, week before really walking through and doing that face-to-face update. Yep, very helpful. So then you want a market that you're moving. I mean, mm-hmm. here's the whole thing. you got to let customers know that you've moved because depending on what direction they're coming from, they may land on the street you're usually on, you're not there. How would they know that you're only a block away? Yeah. So we, we do a lot of A-frame signs at our typical location that point towards the new location. Mm -hmm. Um, We try to make sure we've got a a team member or two that can be down on that street where the art festival is looking for people that look perplexed or have a reusable shopping bag with them and say, hey, you looking for the farmer's market? It's over here today. So all of that to to work on the day before. Um, Printing flyers for the customers so that and spread those all through the market. Give them to your farmers and vendors and say, hey, give them, give these to your customers. Let them know that we're moving next week mm-hmm. is helpful. But about that timing thing, and this applies to flyers and to email newsletters and even sometimes to advisories to your farmers and vendors, you got to be careful about when you send out the notice that you're moving. If you send it out three or four weeks ahead, people assume you're moving that week. That we're just all way too busy and we don't read the details. We read the headlines. And if it says market's moving to Cedar Street and they don't read, then they're going to be down on Cedar Street setting up all by themselves. (laughs) It's all about that timing and waiting until you are close to the move date, but not too close, not too far away. So, yeah, just finding that sweet spot so folks understand what's happening. And this goes for maybe moving for a light in construction event that's happening as well or um, a restaurant build out or, uh, you know, some residences doing something with their front yard, which means you have to kind of adjust the map of your market because it's sticking out into the street. There's a lot of reasons to kind of shuffle and adjust. But just like Kat was saying, you know, folks are going to come to the regular market street and if they see something else happening, they might say, oh, the market closed for the day and leave. So all of this ahead of time marketing is really important. Having signs out there, we always send um, our dear Denny over to the Market Street, and when we move the market, and he just walks up and down the street in his bright green staff shirt, and he just is feels so you know get someone who's comfortable walking up to people and being hey you looking for the market or kind of you have to kind of have to eavesdrop on folks when they're walking around, then they might be saying oh I don't know if it's closed, and if you hear the word closed, you run over and you say are you talking about the market? It's not closed, it's over here, and just kind of being a friendly face to point people over there. That's a good thing for volunteers or maybe people that aren't not fully like trained staff. I mean, Denny is, but, you know, I would send volunteers over there too because it's not like a high skill thing to do. They're just pointing people. They don't have to answer questions. And if folks have questions about which vendors are there or EBT or anything like that, they can just say, hey, go see our information booth. It's on the other block. It's on this corner. They can answer all your questions for you. But that's really important because if folks see construction or another event or something else happen happening on your regular market street, I think what they think automatically is that the market just closed for the day. Sure. And so then your vendors that are over on the next street, they're going to miss out on those sales. So that's a really vital part to doing a market move is having someone physically on your typical market street. Yeah, we try to make good friends, too, with the folks that are running the event that's displacing us Mm -hmm. so that their volunteers and their information booths and sometimes even their exhibitors will go talk to the artists that are displacing the market during Art Walk weekend and Mm -hmm. tell them, hey, if you have somebody wander up the looks perplexed or says, do you know where the farmers are? Mm -hmm. Um, This is where we are. And and also, that's a good opportunity to invite those artists to drift over. Hey, when you need lunch, come on over to the farmer's market. You know, there's plenty there to to offer because they're they're tired of eating crummy takeout food, you know? (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Yep. Tell those construction folks, tell those other restaurants. I mean, when we moved in um, August, the event was at night. But they needed to set up on just one block of our six block market street to to get ready for an evening event. So there was no action happening. Five of the six blocks were just 
sitting there open. People were parking on the street. It it looked like the market had just left for the day there was, and there was no other people around. So we made sure to tell the coffee shops in the neighborhood, you know, tell your business dis- district folks, tell your neighborhood association, post on next door, like get in those groups and just make sure that everyone knows that no matter what's happening on your regular market street, the market is happening. It's just, you know, over a block or two or or maybe it's down the street. Maybe you have to move to like people have to get in their car and go to a different location. So that's really important to make sure everybody has that information. And you'd be surprised who needs to know that information. You know, they're going to ask the mailman. They're going to ask, you know, (laughs) this guy walking his dog down the street that lives in this apartment complex. So just make sure you kind of push that information out to everybody. Yeah, not a terrible idea to kind of send flyers out or little notices to the residents along Mm -hmm. your typical site just so that they can push people over. And, I mean, they may be regular shoppers so that they know where you're going to go. Exactly. So social... Um, you want to say it a lot the week leading up to your move mm-hmm. and say it all day, every five minutes <laughs> yeah. of the day of your move <laughs> and get vendors riled up and excited to post about it, too. So yeah. they need to any vendors that are typically posting a lot, any farmers that often say, hey, this is where we are today. Remind them to do it more often, to tag you so that you can repost their posts and everybody gets amplified mm-hmm. um, and just everybody the whole day of the market in its new location, people need to be talking about where we are. So if your typical Instagram story says, hey, we're at the you know, Ballard Farmer's Market and today we're at this street and this street, you mm-hmm. want to make sure to do a lot of place place location dropping, drop those pins on that map in every post that you make. Yeah, that's a good point, too giving a specific address, just because if people don't know every street in the neighborhood saying, you know, state and cedar, that's not going to mean a lot. But if you say, you know, 400 West Cedar, that's something they can type into their map and then they go, oh, it's just one block over, but it makes a lot more sense. Right. I always do a graphic in Canva that has an actual picture of the, uh, like it's a map. And I point to, this is the typical market street. This is where we're going to be on April 27th and just kind of have an arrow over, have some kind of restaurants on there, like, you know, points where people can are going to recognize, you know, the county building or the freeway so they can get oriented to where your market's going to be. Yeah, for sure. And you've done a good job with those maps, so much so that because they're cute and they've got mm-hmm. little arrows and they have little, you know, this is where we are or we're moving with the little cow. Yep. You know, if you make them cute and catchy, your farmers and vendors will repost and repost and repost. And maybe your business district will do that. And maybe the restaurant that's excited to have you close to them because it's going to bring more people to them. Oftentimes the coffee house that we were in front of for a few years during a construction project, we go back to that street mm-hmm. once a year for, for events, and they're very excited to see us back, and they post a lot that we're by them. They love when we're on their street. They do. I don't think they appreciated how much business we brought into their coffee shop until we moved over one street. I know. And they go, oh, we don't have that foot traffic anymore right in front of our place. So they love it when we're there, and they're happy to tell everybody, come get a cup of coffee, come out to the market. It's going to be right on our doorstep. So they'll get in the in the mode of sharing that as well. And it also, the more you share and kind of spread that information around the neighborhood, the more you you will get residents or businesses saying, oh, did you know that my dumpster's on the on the street on Saturday? Or, oh, hey, you don't, I mean, this was this is what happened last um, time we moved the market is that I was going to loop a residential driveway, of course, because we have to loop all those driveways and we had been marketing it. And someone sent me an email and said, hey, um, I don't know if you're planning on blocking this driveway or not, but you can because I don't park my car in there. Just I didn't know if you knew that. And it was just a new resident I had never met before. And I was like, sir, you are saving my life right now because I was trying to figure out what to do with those farmers over there. So getting that information out will help you. You might also get folks that say, how dare you move the market onto my street? It's going to be so noisy. Oh, this is horrible. And then you can just say it's one day. It's not my choice. Calm down <laughs> and say right, it in yeah. a nice way. But for the most part, it'll be helpful. And and the neighbors are usually willing to like ask questions or get clarification on things or help you. So kind of pushing that information out everywhere, not just to who you think your farmer's market audience is. Right. Make sure you talk to the neighborhood. Well, and that brings us to kind of a silver lining of moving temporarily. That is just like when you do move a vendor 10 feet. Mm-hmm. They don't They don't realize this, but people sometimes come into the market with blinders on and they're just beelining to those usual seven vendors that they buy all their stuff from. When you shuffle people around, and I wish we could do this more, but it makes people unhappy. So <laughs> we don't, but it makes the, the people being moved unhappy, especially. <laughs> yeah. When you move things around, people notice you. 
Mm-hmm. So they're not on blind. They're as they're zooming past, they go, "Whoa, whoa! I've never seen you before. Are you new here?" We've had that happen so many times, especially when we move to a temporary location. Oh, are you new at the farmers market? And you know, the vendor will say, "Nope, been here eight years." <laughs> It's just you've never noticed before because now I'm in a different set of folks or I'm in a different location on those Mm -hmm. blocks. So silver lining wise, your regular customers may find people that they've never noticed before just because they're kind of shuffled up. Entirely new people may find you because those folks don't wander down to the block where you are on Saturdays, but they're on the block where you are for the day. Mm -hmm. And so we oftentimes with a 16-year-old market have people say, Oh, I didn't even know we had a market in the neighborhood. I'm like, what? Do you just usually sleep till three on Saturday? What's happening? But <laughs> to this day, it happens. <laughs> to this day. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And just folks that are, you know, there temporarily in other places, they might not have seen you on your original block. They see you on this block. I just find that every time we move, we actually get a big bump the weeks after because we've attracted a whole new group of people that just didn't have, we weren't in their just normal route in our usual location, but Mm -hmm. they discovered us that day that we moved. Exactly. And especially if you're moving because another special event is happening on your regular market street, the folks that are coming out to, you know, for example, the arts fest that happens in our neighborhood, those folks come from all over. They come for this art fest. They follow it around. They're there every year. And then they wander over to the market because it's adjacent And they are like, oh, this is such a great market. You're here every Saturday. This is wonderful. And then they come back and become regular shoppers. So you can kind of capture an an increased market, really, of people that are coming out there. So the audience is a little bit different and new. And bringing those uh, vendors that are not typically together. You know, I see a lot of like vendor collaborations and like new friendships that happen because we shuffle them all up and they get they make new friends. So, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a, a real benefit. I mean, it's a lot of work, and I don't want to have to move the market at all ever. It's a headache, <laughs> and this is probably in case not... anybody's listening and thinks that you like it. In case the city of San Diego is tuning in, I don't like it because <laughs> um, it's just a big old hassle. But you know, in the end, it feels like okay, that was a fine experience, and that's as you know, a market operator, it's just something we have to do sometimes, and it's not all bad. No, it's not all bad. There's just definitely things to be gained in terms mm-hmm. of sometimes folks opt out. Like mm-hmm. We let farmers that just can't cope with the new conditions opt out that day. Well, that means we have space for substitute vendors that come in that we mm-hmm. haven't had before. So we get to know a new vendor and they get exposed to all these shoppers. And then, you know, I mean, that last uh, that last bit of silver lining is that there's some serious frazzle bonding that goes on. <laughs> oh, boy. And it's, well, it's, I mean, it is like anything that happens that's, you know, irregular in the market sphere. You know, yeah, the vendors see you working really hard. You're working together with your staff really hard and doing different things and doing more things and, you know, working with people in the neighborhood and everyone notices that it's a lot of work. And, you know, I notice that the, it's a lot of work for the vendors, too. And we kind of get that kind of shared, not misery, but... Frazzle. Shared, frazzle. Yeah, shared frazzle. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it brings us closer together. And, every, and everyone is actually usually more chill on those days than they are on just a regular day. They all just like, I don't ever really have a situation where the vendors are like more like outwardly stressed. They just kind of take it as like, OK, this is new and different. There's a lot going on. I need to chill. And the shoppers, too. And the neighbor, it's like everyone's just like, OK, this is new and different. There's a lot going on. Let's all relax. Let's all help each other. We're very cooperative. And it's usually like a pleasant day. Like yeah. Mm-hmm. I find that, too. People just kind of gear up yeah. for, OK, it's going to be different. So we're going to have to do things a little differently. And the, and they laugh about things that yeah. you run out of street before you run out of boots because yeah. we measured something or something popped up or there's a dumpster. But ah, nightmare. Um, there's yeah. a tree in my tent. That's things right. like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those have always been fun. But, yeah, the, the end of the day always uh, feels kind of good. And, of course, always going home feels good. Exactly. And farmers market managers, farmers and vendors are nothing if not resilient and creative, which is shown by these moves. Together, we can make these necessary adjustments productive and even have a little bit of fun along the way. And think how nice it will be to come home to your usual site the following week. Absence just might make the heart grow fonder. Thanks for listening today. And big thanks to Square for helping farmers market participants and managers increase their income and reduce their stress, and for supporting Tent Talk, the farmers market podcast. To sign up for easy credit card processing on site at markets and simple invoicing back at your desk, just click the Square logo on the resource page at farmersmarketpros.com. 
Thanks for listening to Tent Talk today. Please leave us a review on your podcast app or wherever you listen to Tent Talk. Let us and others know how you're enjoying the podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of Tent Talk. Connect with fellow Farmer's Market folks in our private Facebook group, the Farmer's Market Pros Community, and follow us on Instagram at Farmer's Market Pros. Find online education and other resources at FarmersMarketPros.com. Tent Talk is brought to you by Farmer's Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Tent Talk is hosted by Cat Fields White and Bridget Myers and produced by Leandra Hayes, with original music by David Mead. Tune in next week for another great episode.